Welcome back. So here's the deal, everyone. There's been a story floating around the media. It started with Upper Echelon Games, essentially that a QA studio played a not particularly good role in Cyberpunk 2077, which obviously we know what its launch date uh, was like. Now, the reporting has kind of ranged from the more extreme takes to perhaps, let's just say, the more realistic. So today, we're going to try to sort things through. As a little tidbit, uh, Connor, who was researching this video at one point, had, was it 82 Moby Games tabs open while he was looking through credits to try to validate info. So there's a lot here. Yeah, and also credits in the video game industry are really weird and interesting. I'm sure anyone who's tried to f- figure out, you know, oh, who's working on the games I liked? It's, it's, it's bad, it's bad. Yeah, not totally, absolutely. Um, of course, as a first little thing, if you'd like to support the video game that we are producing, you can check out The Pale Beyond on Steam if you're interested in a survival, well, primarily narrative, uh, you know, survival kind of theme, role-playing game set in, uh, well, sort of Antarctic situation. It's uh, come along pretty damn well be out this year. So, check that out in Steam. With that said, let's talk about this story. So, Upper Echelon basically released a report claiming that uh, there's maybe more to the story than just CD Projekt Red completely dropping the ball, where essentially a whistleblower uh, contacted him from a company called Quantic Labs. They're a quality assurance studio that supported CDPR on both Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk. Um, Now, they're actually part of um, Embracer Group. Well, who isn't, but yeah. Uh, Yep, who isn't. Um, They are actually under the THQ Nordic brand, and they were acquired in 2020. And if you look here, they have a very long list of clients. There's Focus, previously known as Focus Home, Team 17, Techland, like a bunch of, you know, a bunch that you will recognize, Paradox, Ubisoft. So, big old company with legit clients. (laughs) And if you look at the testimonials, we actually have one here from the QA coordinator. Um, I think it was detailing mobile games, so probably like Thronebreaker or Gwent, something like that. And that's from CDPR themselves. And we actually see in Cyberpunk 2077's credits, 70 plus people who are credited on the game who are staffers of Quantic lab yeah so it wasn't like cdpr were trying to hide this or anything they were very much up front hey quantic lab did this qa it's in the game credits all that stuff so that's one bit of information yeah so we know they worked on it Hmm. now then it is about the whistleblower what the whistleblower uh gave to upper echelon and kind of what flows forth from that so the whistleblower alleged that quantic labs uh basically actively manipulated CD Projekt Red on various aspects of their capabilities that they um, adopted practices for the QA workflow that actively harmed development of the game. And to support this claim, Upper Echelon was given a 72-page QA testing file, HR paperwork, workflow charts, production maps, detailed spreadsheets, tracking productivity, and uh, additional documentation from early on in the QA process. So essentially the allegation is that Quantic misled and kind of you could say effectively betrayed cdpr in a way yeah i mean there's the headlines around the press are things like cyberpunk report claims qa company lied to cdpr about bugs cdprs or cyberpunk's buggy release blamed on qa company lying to cdpr that's kind of the vibe that the initial reporting sort of took whenever people were reporting about it is these people lied about what they were doing that's why cyberpunk was so buggy that's the super high top level view that people have now Important to note, no one has been able to corroborate this. None whatsoever. Um, now, th- there have been people who have reached out to their sources. Uh, Legacy Killer, who you might recognize from YouTube. We'll get to what uh, his sources said uh, later today. But basically, here's how kind of compared to, you can, you can sort of see here, the cyberpunk timeline, how things sort of track. So starting in Q4 2019, the Quantic Lab project leads went to Poland to basically get a steer from CDPR, and uh, the initial team was then stood up for the QA task. That team was understood by CDPR to be comprised of industry veterans, including people who worked in Witcher 3, right? It's then alleged that this actually wasn't the case, that most of the team were junior staff with less than a year experience in the best cases. The project lead was also listed as only having one year's experience and that CD Projekt Red were not made aware of this fact. So essentially the allegation is that CDPR were not getting the staff that they were led to believe they were paying for. Now the allegations get worse, where apparently the workflow that they had kind of mandated at like bugs per day found. (laughs) That seems so whack to me that seems weird but apparently the highest quote of those was from the free roam elements of the game 
which is hardly a surprise. Now, this meant that the staff were required to log, um, which means identify a bug and reproduce the bug, at least 10 bugs a day per person. Uh, Theoretically, management believed that this was driving up productivity, and this would mean that the game would be very rigorously tested because an employee would find a bug, and rather than sort of dilly-dallying or or whatever, they'll be like, okay, I've got a bug. Right, got to get 10 today, on to the next bug, on to find the new thing. I mean, that makes sense if the only thing you care about is a bug no matter what the bug actually is. Yes, and certainly quantity of bugs is not as important as uh, quality of bugs because not all bugs are equally disruptive. Yeah. <laughs> so this basically meant that they were driven by these targets rather than by the quality, right? So they were just finding simple, easy to reproduce bugs, um, you know, like a, a minor graphical glitch, the sort of thing that is not really a deal breaker for the game, a performance glitch, that kind of thing. Well, performance, more of a deal breaker, but perhaps not the real foundational, like big issue bugs that you really do need to know about. Yeah, and I mean, again, these are allegations. Yeah. You have to keep on making that clear. Yeah, because if it is true that that's how they, and you can kind of see how you would you would imagine this to be true, that they are kind of, or at least the workflow is true of, oh, we have a lot of QA to do. We need some kind of middle management production targets and productivity targets. Okay, so a bug is a bug no matter what. And then that's like, hey, this game crashes whenever you enter this area. That's a bug. This game takes another takes about a second longer than anticipated to load a shadow. That's also a bug. These two are very much not alike. And you can see how this would ultimately lead to, and even not even like game performance breaking ones, because the immediate stuff in my head is like, how do you figure out what, say, a combat bug that is, oh, this stat is actually being generated or produced wrong somewhere along the line. That's uh, going to require a lot of work. Yeah, that'll require a lot of work. Whereas, you know, driving a car into a crowd of pedestrians and seeing if any bodies ragdoll in an open world game or move differently is going to be a lot easier. Christ. Yeah, yeah. So this apparently, allegedly, led to thousands of bugs being filed, but CDPR apparently were getting frustrated because they're like looking at all these bugs and it's like, okay, great, we have a torrent of bugs, but... We need the high priority, like the really important bugs. So they apparently got frustrated and eventually uh, instructed Quantic to stop sending the low priority ones and to instead focus on core systems, the most important to solve problems. This apparently created a tougher environment for the QA testers who had to basically, uh, you know, adjust their existing pattern of work to uh, the more serious issues, just leads to pressure, you know, crunchy stuff, and that often does not equal the best results. The team then apparently in summer 2020 gets expanded from 30 to 60. As anyone who's worked in a team that has doubled in size will know, that does not double productivity. A lot of these staff allegedly were new hires, so they already needed training. Training provided by people who were already on the job because doing QA for one game is a bit different from another. So the experience of the 30 more veteran QA testers will be needed to help the new 30 get up to speed. Then the final allegation of the whistleblower that kind of encapsulates it all is that Quantic Labs then would misrepresent their capabilities to their uh, prospective partners. Though apparently per uh, the update video from Upper Echelon, not to CD Projekt Red. So that is a criticism of Quantic that came from the whistleblower, but one that did not apply to their contract with CDPR, allegedly. Got to use the word allegedly quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. The, now, the, yeah, it all boils down to me the allegations that maybe QL aren't doing as quite as good a job as they could have or should have. And that's kind of, kind of like the, the overall vibe of the whistleblower saying this company's not as good as you think. Yeah. And then as for Quantic, they apparently have a toxic culture of just, you know, NDAs up the wazoo, which, I mean, if you're doing QA for unreleased games for major development partners and AAA studios, yeah, you need a very watertight NDA. Yeah. You, you do, right? That, I don't think that's a fairly uncontroversial statement. Um, but they were silencing criticism internally, and they had a 10,000 euro fine for disclosing confidential information that would be applied to um, disclosure of just, you know, work on, on projects, even if it was on one's portfolio. Hmm. But the thing is, it's in the industry not expected that you put unannounced project materials in your portfolio before that's been announced and you kind of have got the thumbs up for that. But that's something that a company can do reasonably. It's something a company could also do in an unreasonable fashion. So we'll have to see because an NDA is not a toxic thing, but it's all how the tool is used, I suppose. 
Absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, the further allegation is that dissent is dealt with very harshly. People are reprimanded, apparently coerced into resignation if there's continued uh, disagreements, and that all of this would have happened uh, during the time frame where the due diligence by Embracer Group would have been going on. All quite interesting, quite fiery stuff, I think you'll agree. Absolutely. I mean, it is worth noting that this is all from a whistleblower, and you kind of have to go, well... Obviously, whistleblowers can have the best of intentions. Other times, there can be the kind of, I had a bad time here, and I'm going to express that, especially when you have that from yeah. one source. That's why, you know, uh, Jason Schreier wouldn't speak to one person and say, here's this awful company based off this one thing. But it is worth reporting anyway. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's like it's generally, I think, before you... I mean, like in a lot of like the more legacy media, and I think this is something that maybe was... Uh, maybe it's less true now. Mm. But it kind of used to be you'd have, like, two or three independent, not anonymous sources. And I think nowadays we kind of have, you know, more reporting than just, like, one anonymous source. So, I mean, this is probably a better situation where it's one individual, but I have to assume that they've been, like, verified as, as an actual person. Oh, of course. Instead yeah. of just an anon. Um, but it's kind of, like, interesting, and I, I suppose the more independent sources um, that have their identity disclosed to the outlet... That's like your. That's a good measure, anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not always perfect, but it's it's a decent measure. So, as for how much we can trust all this reporting, here's the situation. Right now, we basically have upper echelon's word. Uh, so the documents have not been released. They've not been shared with any other party, um, other than a heavily redacted version in the video. And the whistleblower has not approached anyone else. Now, to have those documents be redacted and not be uh, disclosed in full, that is uh, reasonable. Because they could have identifiable stuff, legal implications for the whistleblower, that uh, that is actually a normal thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and yes, we only have upper echelon's word for it. The thing there is that if his word is wrong and he goes hard on a given topic, then he suffers reputational damage. So he, of course, does have incentives to, uh, to get this one right. Yeah, it's not the same as those, like, leakers you'll see talking about video games who show up on like r slash gaming leaks and rumors all the time and are like this is literally no one making random guesses online and seeing if they're right and if they're wrong they just close their account reappear under a different name entirely it's not quite that there is actually skin in the game here for this yeah so that adds a little bit of credibility to at least the kind of um how he looked over the information and verified and stuff yeah. like that now, currently, there is no party named in this leak that has provided additional context or any official form of comment. But that being said, uh, Quantic did actually have an internal email that went around following this report. And of course, that email was passed on to Upper Echelon, right? <laughs> so basically, their email says that it was inaccurate and misleading, which, I mean, they... They would say, almost anyway. Um, it also has an implied threat that they will be investigating the reasons behind these speculations, and they're encouraging staff to not respond to any inquiries, and they're also, of course, referring to the NDA policy, and, uh, you know, that legal action will be taken to get to the bottom of the speculations. Because that's what happens when people violate their NDA to talk to press. You know, yeah. the company will then go and be like, well, okay, we did this NDA, now we have to use it. Uh, right, now... We then, uh, so with all this going on, we were kind of looking at this story, and uh, I think Connor just fell right. It's time to go and really see how deep we can go in this, see if there's anything else we can find. So cue him doing a, a rough unscientific check into Moby Games for credits, uh, right? Um, for the individuals who are listed as, as testers. In the majority of cases, tester cases, they were listed as only having credits dating back to 2019, and then after that, there's like a significant gap and then you hit 2014. Insofar as management goes per the credits, uh, from the project manager level upwards, only one individual has a similar 2019, uh, 2022 pattern of credits, and the rest seem to hold a number of credits over, uh, over several years. So it's a bit weird in that uh, there are like gaps in the credits, and one way you could read that is, okay, junior, unexperienced. Another way you could read that, though, is that Creditation in the games industry is really shit sometimes, especially when you are dealing with outsourced work. Yeah, I mean... So that could be a dimension as well. Yeah, because Moby Games is used as a decent database for this stuff, but even then it's not completely up-to-date or accurate. And then you've got the case of people being credited under different names. And especially when it comes to... Like, I find at least for a lot of these, like, larger QA houses, you won't have an individual credit name. It'll be, oh, this, you know, QA additionals, QA done by X. 
and it's just the organization. And that's yeah. one of the problems you kind of run into here of this whole outsourcing thing. But it does, you know, basically it means it's really hard to tell. It's impossible to f figure out who's actually worked on what, unless yeah. they're like a director, basically. The, the golden thing is just people with information. And one of them is actually uh, Legacy Kill HD, who uh, sort of did a threat, right? Uh, said, spoke to a few different CD Projekt Red sources that worked in Cyberpunk 2077. They all rec uh, refuted this claim. And to go through his threat, one dev told me, we knew about the bugs that people were complaining about. This is not something that was unknown to us, but we did not have the time to focus on it. We were crunching like crazy, so we were paper thin at the end. Uh, the same dev also said that more important or technical aspects of the game were being tested internally. Especially later in development, complex bugs required in-depth involvement with the dev team. Quantic QA role, uh, that was minimal, with much of the issues being CD Projekt Red's own mismanagement. Here's a quote. Anything that flows in is screened by internal QA production and devs. It's not like we were morons and spending hours on obviously bad bugs. Management not knowing about the bugs slash issues is just laughable. They knew, everyone knew, they would play the game all day, every day. Of course, having internal QA, yes, they will have that. Sometimes you just need to spin up more resources, and that is where an outsourcing partner will appear. Now, uh, Legacy Killer also did respond on the update video from Upper Echelon. Basically just said, I uh, hope you understand my CDPR contacts. Uh, they, you know, they didn't necessarily dispute uh, the report, um, they only said that Quantic had a more minimal role, especially in terms of what went wrong with the game. And he eventually just ends up saying the devs could not fix the bugs in time. They knew the bugs. And this was because of, quote, insane deadlines set by management, yeah. which very much is the story we had already believed about this game. Yeah, so that's the thing. This, like, doesn't actually materially change anything about Cyberpunk 2077, how it was developed or anything. It is just additional context that might explain why there may be a little bit more bugs or it might have been a little bit more difficult. But fundamentally, it is just, hey, CDPR released this game and it's really buggy and they didn't fix it and it barely ran on old consoles and PlayStation actually pulled it from the store and it's all a big nightmare and it's destroyed the reputation. And also, the QA outsourcers maybe weren't exceptionally good at their job as well. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, and if you want to think about blame, well, here's just a quote from the co-founder of the company, Marcin yeah. uh, Awinski, who said, myself and the board are the final decision makers and it was our call to release the game. Yep. That's the word. Yeah, it's just like, I mean, I guess that's the thing, right? Everyone wants drama around this game. So people reading the story will obviously take the, like the headline version of, what was it? Report claim. This is from Forbes. Report claims Cyberpunk 2077 bugs weren't caught because a QA company lied to CTPR. And that's a case of that may very well be literally true, but you would need in brackets probably a, a lot of really minor bugs that don't really super matter all yeah, that much. Yeah, it's like brackets. And yeah. It didn't matter too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just interesting when you kind of follow up with some of the things that CDPR had said in the past, right? You know, one of them is saying that, you know, as it turned out, their testing did not show a big part of the issues that people experienced while playing the game. And like, that's a kind of funny one in light of the whistleblowing, but it just seems that CDPR themselves were focused on those core issues, not Quantic. So I don't really think that one holds up yeah it's like no matter what ultimately happens uh assuming that legacy killer sources are accurate and we're saying you know the people internally and the leaders were playing the game there's no way they didn't see this stuff especially when it comes to the deliberate decision to not show the game on the last gen consoles on the, the base ones at least because everyone knows that there's no way we're like okay hey here's a pre-release build like a week before or whatever time before it goes gold ah it's running perfectly and then something in the master build or the day one patch wrecks it all. Because there's no way that happened, right? Yeah. And that, even, that stuff would have gotten better. Even weird things like for those uh, legacy consoles, the, the older yeah. ones. Like on the topic of that in their earnings call uh, in um, the November 25th, 2020, which is like just before the game comes out. Um, Adam K uh, Kaczynski uh, says, you know, of the performance, like, of course, it's a bit lower than on the pros, but surprisingly good, I would say, for such a, a huge world. So a bit lower, but very good. Well, yeah. That ain't how it performed. Um, okay. The only explanation <laughs> is that Adam here just, fit, I don't know, maybe got used to playing games in PS3 
Yeah, the or, wrong HDMI yeah. source in his TV. Yeah, she's so like, oh yeah, it works fine. Or maybe you know, maybe he had a TV with frame interpolation oh, no, that was interpolating his his 15 frame per second <laughs> up to 30. He was like, that looks fine to me. If somebody <laughs> said that, I would think that's fine. I mean, that is time to sue for defamation. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the problem here, right? It's like, yeah, they very clearly. Maybe not in any literal sense lied, but they did misrepresent the performance of their game to investors yeah. and publicly before it came out. So it doesn't even matter if, you know, if it turns out that all of this was Quantic Labs and it was completely destroyed and they were sabotaged internally. None of that would even matter at the end of the day because they still were like, game's fine. Yeah, please that's, buy. That's the rub. Yep. That's the rub. And I think uh, on the, the situation. It's like, you know, where do we come to with this? How do we resolve all these things that are going around? I think it's very easy for things to be black and white. Like, it must be A or it must be B. In reality, it's everything. So, they had insane deadlines to publish the game. The management were clearly deluded about the situation that they were in. The developers are trying to blow the own, their own whistles internally and they weren't being listened to. At the same time, you have a outsourcing QA company that perhaps was trying to puff up its chest a little bit to some of it, its its external partners, I mean, I think which is very normal in sales. I'm not saying it's good. I am saying it does happen a lot. So there's that. Maybe, yeah, they have this way of doing workflow that causes a load of bugs to be found that are not the most important bugs. But even that's a weird situation because if you were trying to make this be like a Red Dead Redemption 2 console release where, you know, it's just like, cool, game's not buggy it's perfect it's beautiful there's no visual glitches it's just incredible all those bugs would be useful yeah but that's where you would but ultimately management ensured that none of that could be useful and if they have a bunch of junk bugs coming through it's like well that's that's kind of on on them working with their partner it's like ultimately if quantic are dropping the ball and aren't good for this you can just find another qa partner surely or you can give them different instructions. And yeah. Also, you have internal QA. Yeah, even in the worst case, you go, okay, we have to. We can't publicly blame an external QA because that's bad form. But you know, you say something like, "We're having issues QAing. This game is being delayed. Delayed again until it works." That's like the worst case scenario. But they decided the worst case was everyone buys it and it's busted. So that's kind of the problem. Where ultimately it takes two to tango, and that's a case where. Yeah, maybe both parties here were wrong. That's possible. Yeah, I think that is, honestly, I think that's what's likely. Yeah. So I think that it's very easy to do a sensational headline here. Uh, you know, CD Projekt Red were betrayed. They did nothing wrong at all. Absolutely yeah. perfect. Uh, you know, they, they were let down. And maybe they were, but I think the point is, like, that doesn't humongously humongously matter. Doesn't change the story at all. Doesn't change the story. The story ultimately is one of their board failing their customers, failing their shareholders, failing their own staff. And their platform partners too. And their platform partners, yeah. So Just about everyone. That's the takeaway. This has almost been like a fun little relitigation of the Cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> situation with a bit new information. Yeah. But I think the core point is that even if everything from that whistleblower is true, doesn't change the conclusion. Absolutely. The outcome's still the outcome. So... There you go. That's the situation. And uh, if you want to see how well QA'd our game is, then of course you can wishlist it on Steam and uh, we'll see how launch day goes. We do have time penciled in to do a lot of QA and we actually do have a, a bit of a partner for that. So hopefully it goes well. Good luck development team. They can Good probably luck. hear me say that. They're just over there. Okay. <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Wishlist baby on Steam and I'll see you next time.